brindled cat hath mewed. Thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Harpia cries, tis time, tis time. Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. Toad, that under cold stone days and nights has thirty-one. Sweltered Benham. Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. Toad, that under cold stone days and nights has thirty-one. Sweltered Benham, double, double, toil and trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. Fillet of a fanny snake in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog. Atta's fork and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing. For a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble. See, they're not very nice, are they, witches? They like want to hurt people. Just wearing all black, kind of like bin bags, isn't it? And, like lots of warts and a big hat. Mm -hmm. She flies on a broomstick. That's yeah. kind of how you associate a witch, isn't it? That's what, like, what you think of when you think of witch. Um, hippies. <laughs> <laughs> the burning man. I don't know whether it's got something got to do with that. Because I'm from Ireland, maybe all the kind of like pagan and Celtic jewellery that kind of goes along with that. What Harry is? Potter, Harry Potter yeah. and the Teenage Witch. Antichrist by Lars von Trier. Tarot cards, uh, Sylvia Plath's poem Daddy. Folklore, mm -hmm. spells, it would make me think of tradition. In Cornwall it would make me think of um, the Witches Museum, I think, in Boscastle. It would make me think of Tintagel, where they've got some magic going on. Films like The Wicker Man. Um, the, the classic with Christopher Lee, who sadly isn't with us anymore. The occult, kind of, uh, with paganism as well, which is um, rife within many, many different regions <coughs> throughout Europe and, and, and largely the world as well. Not an expert on the Wiccans, but I know that they are the white witches. People just used roots and herbs and vegetables and old techniques to, to cure the, the, the people of the village. Wiccan is very much a way of life. I wouldn't be the person to practice it because I don't believe in practicing things that you don't quite understand. Same thing as a sort of, um, what's it called, an Ouija board. Um, I don't fully understand an Ouija board so I wouldn't be the person to do it. I have a friend who had gone to a, um, like a, like a circle, like a meeting, but she wasn't actually into it, but they said that she had some, that they thought she had something special. But she hasn't got into it really, but she thought she might like to. My brother, who lives in France, he um, has loads of friends who are into that kind of thing, and it's a lot more open and accepted over there to talk about. Whereas if you talk about it in public here, people kind of just laugh it off because it's not really important to them. I would say it's accepted here though, it's just like not many people actually practice it here. Well, not that I know of anyway. I, I've met Wiccan people. My sister was a Wiccan. I've met people associated with my family as Wiccans. I was once bitten by a dog of a Wiccan family and they healed me within seconds. I don't care about what my friends think. I believe in it.
visited one of the mothers of modern witchcraft. I've been doing this since 1970. I consider myself first and foremost the priestess of the gods. That means masculine and feminine. And I call myself a witch. My religion is Wicca, but I am a witch first and foremost. And that means I'm a servant to the entire community, no matter what faith they are, color, creed, anything. I'm here for humanity because I'm part of humanity. And that is what the job of a witch should be. We are servants of the divine. Traditional English witchcraft came out of Gerald Gardner and later Alexander, who called himself King of the Witches, which by the way, he was not. Um, it was a title he put on himself. What it is, is that in communities like ours, like Cornwall and like Ireland, the old folk traditions still exist. And this is where witchcraft, real, true witchcraft, came from. Not from ritual magic, not from studying uh, things like the, you know, the Kabbalah, etc. It came from how you lived close to the land, what you did with the land and how you worked with the land spirits, the gods and goddesses. My name's Simon Costin. I'm the director of the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. Wicca grew out of Gerald Gardner's um, pulling together various threads. Um, he was very uh, into sort of the idea of polarity, so that the, the god and the goddess were honoured equally. One was not above the other. Um, he, they believed in sort of reincarnation, and there was another life after this one. There's a spirit realm. Wick has changed immensely since Gerald Gardner set it, established it. We are changing it and trying to teach the real mystery behind witchcraft um, as not a, 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 how can I put it, not tied into the Middle Ages garbage of um, demons and angels and God, you know, God knows what else, and God knows what else, but also into understanding how our ancestors, our country village women, which is, especially here in Ireland, you see, how they work, what they used to do. They, they were, in Irish, the, the word is Badafasa, it means the wise woman, or Theophasa, the wise man. And so what we do is we work to use our religion, our philo spiritual philosophy, in everyday life. Three degrees, so you're initiated and you go from first, second to third. Um, other ideas to do with the spirit world, connection with nature is very important. Um, Honouring the seasons, the eight Sabbaths, equinoxes and solstices, the key to, to Wiccan practice. It's not just Wiccans, I mean a lot of pagans are interested. Wicca is one branch of paganism. Paganism is a sort of umbrella term for a lot of different practices, um, Wicca being one of them. When we came here, Stuart and I moved here in 1976, and we wanted to keep a very low profile because we did not know how good Catholic Ireland would accept us. It actually welcomed us with open arms because the idea of this Banfassa, this, this witch wise woman, was totally accepted. Over the space of six months of being here, I would have people come to my front door and ask me to do healing for them. Um, they bring me gifts. They bring me sacks of potatoes, vegetables, even tins of food for my cats. That's how accepting they were of the witch, the village witch. The church is always uh, wary of a group or an individual who has knowledge that they don't, or power that they don't, and particularly women having power um, within Christianity. I did not go out to seek it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was a Sunday school teacher mm -hmm. and a very good Christian. And a friend of mine became interested in witchcraft and of course I had worked in the music industry. I worked for Brian Epstein who managed the Beatles mm -hmm. and I worked for Nems Enterprises who were their music managers. I must have been the only person in the 1960s that I know of who did not smoke, did not drink, did not do drugs and was still a virgin. And when I saw the work the witches were doing, and by the way when I say the witches back then I'm talking about people who to be absolutely honest, my, a lot of my philosophy and a lot of my attitudes change over those many, many years. But at least they did one thing that mattered to me a lot, and it was healing. And I watched the witches heal a sick child. And I was amazed, because that child was supposed to die. Within 24 hours of them working magic, that child sat up in bed and demanded ice cream. 
And then I decided I would uh, join them. And that was very traumatic to join a witch way back then, because back then, unlike today, it was considered compulsory to work naked, skyclad. I had never seen a naked man in my life, and as far as I was concerned, to take my clothes off, oh my God. The Darnayans, the people of the goddess Dana, probably came out of the Black Sea area and spread across, and finally arrived in Ireland. In Irish myth and folklore legend, these were the gods. There was Breed, who later became St. Bridget. There was Dana herself, after who the Danube is named. There was the Morrigan, and the Morrigan was the, the battle queen who rode over the fields in the shape of a great raven. And all these legends are interlinked from a memory of an ancient culture. But in uh, human folk memory, the spirits of the land have adapted themselves and become these living deities. When down the road from us, we have a river. It's the River Boyne. She was the goddess Bowen. And in ancient times, the goddess Bowen demanded seven sacrifices every year. To this day, that river still takes seven lives every year. interesting relationship with this museum. Um, he met Cecil Williamson in the Atlantis Bookshop in London um, just before Cecil set up his museum on the Isle of Man. And um, Cecil then, Cecil Williamson who founded this museum, then went over to the Isle of Man and started to set up his museum. And um, Gerald Gardner just turned up quite unexpectedly. Um, and um, they had this agreement that Gardner would become the resident witch at the Isle of Man um, Museum. It was quite interesting because Cecil Williamson had um, his interest in witchcraft had begun in the southwest uh, and was very much um, rooted in the kind of traditional folk magic of this part of Britain. Uh, whereas Gerald Gardner had just published his book High Magic's Aid and he was um, very interested in promoting the whole idea of Wicca um, and the idea of um, a kind of um, magic that um, was a sort of spiritual, a, a spiritual movement I think would be the, be the way to say it. So whereas Cecil Williamson's primary interest was in spellcraft and people who were um, performing magic to achieve specific objects like healing or um, protection magic and that kind of thing. Um, Gerald Gardner's interest was in promoting a kind of spiritual viewpoint. Um, one of the things which is quite um, interesting about Gardnerian Wicca is that the kind of the idea of um, the the Wiccan altar, where you have objects that have like a kind of devotional quality to them. I think the Wiccan, um, the way Gerald Gardner's um, magical beliefs developed into Wicca is kind of illustrated more by these sort of more devotional objects. So this is a very interesting figure and um, often misunderstood, the, the, the horned god. If you look at actually early Christian um, representations of the devil, the devil didn't have horns in early Christian art. Um, so the idea of um, a horned figure as being devilish is actually really kind of quite late medieval. 
but it does seem to have become a kind of real um, stereotype in the popular idea of magic, that sort of horned figures are associated with the devil. certainly true that magic, pra magical practice is very ancient and a lot of it has its roots in pre-Christian uh, practices and traditions and belief systems. A ritual for Halloween might be for me an opportunity to remember my ancestors so I might make an altar which would consist of images of people that I love who are no longer alive. I might burn candles, I might spend time meditating on the fact that I and everybody I know will die the fact that that is an opportunity for transformation. I might use it practically in terms of uh, using that ritual as a, uh, an opportunity to revisit my own will and to think about how what, uh, what I will be leaving for my children and my children's children after that. So in an example like that, I might deploy various techniques. I might use meditation, I might use song, I might use creation of ceremonial space, but it will be focused around that group of ideas. Whereas at a different point in the year, I will be thinking about different, different things. So the ritual practice flows from the place in which we find ourselves and the time in which we find ourselves. Salome, Salome, dance. I pray thee, dance for me. I am sad tonight. When I came hither, I slipped in blood, which is an evil omen. I am sad tonight. Therefore, dance for me. Dance for me, Salome, I beseech you. If you dance for me, you may ask of me what you will, and I will give it to you, even unto the half of my kingdom. We both knew that we had known each other in Egypt, in Karnak, about 4,000 years ago. Stuart and I, in that past incarnation, had been separated at one of the great festivals of Karnak. It was the festival of Opet. What we did not know until that sunny evening, year, that festival took place on July the 19th. July the 19th was the great festival of Opet. The Rising of Sirius, dedicated to the goddess Isis, and I was a priestess of Isis. With most of the patriarchal religions, they consider it's a one-off life. That was not the teachings of early Christianity. The early Christians believed in reincarnation. When we were brother and sister, the opposite sex, which I wrote down at the age of eight years old. He wasn't born, I was born in 1950, he was not born until 1964. I had no idea he'd had this regression, so I had no idea about this name until we started talking, and I was able to show him my diary from way back then. Because when my mother had died, from the time my mother was dying, uh, up until about three or four years later, uh, he kept materialising as my sister and while my mother was in hospital desperately ill he would sit and keep me company. He wasn't even born at that stage and the first time his mother ever met me she took one look at me and she said, I know you. She said, but I was carrying gun and I was sworn I, was sworn I was going to have twins. You're the missing twin. 
Now, sometimes you will meet people that you're supposed to meet to learn a lesson from because you didn't resolve the problem with them in the last life. Sometimes the lesson is to learn that you have to walk away from them because you did it in the last life. So, or life before. So, you meet the same people again and again. My name is Lorraine Flaherty and I am a clinical hypnotherapist but I specialise in more of the esoteric processes for the most part in my work. From a really early age I was very conscious that there was more to life than the things that I was being told and so there were many things that I saw and experienced that didn't make sense, particularly having an awareness that there was another realm, another world inconsistencies in the things that I was being told led me to search not just all of the different religions of the world but to trace them back to the earliest times and I found that there were these common themes and the common theme was always that there were answers embedded within us that through some form of self-reflection or meditation we could get access to and that all of the secrets were, were there. As I said, for me, the key thing is that hypnosis is, well, partly it's very misunderstood because actually all the state of hypnosis really is, is a focused state of attention. I liken the mind to being like a giant computer and it, the subconscious realm is like the hard drive where all the information is, is stored. What we're doing as, as hypnotherapists is going in and making alterations to the, the, the operating centre, to that hard drive. The first thing I would say is Look back to your childhood. Look back to the things that formed you in your dreams or things you were attracted to in your childhood. That's vitally important. Opening the files up and really exploring, having a, a good look around in there and finding out where the flaws are or the breaks and, and then healing from there. Taking self into uh, a, a, a very inward focusing space is actually hypnosis. It's been around for thousands and thousands of years. One of the biggest challenges that I face when I talk about doing hypnosis and doing hypnotherapy is this idea that people can be controlled and that they can be manipulated. And in a therapeutic setting, it's always a partnership, people are working together, so there is very little scope for that. I think the key role of hypnotherapy is bringing into balance both the aspects of the, particularly the divine feminine, which needs a little, lot of support right now, but also bringing in the balance of the masculine and the feminine with each, within each and every person, because I think it's really important. I think we've been through a period of history where it's been very male dominated, and I think that we're, we're, we're coming back now that the woman's empowerment and, and you know, bringing that back into the fore is really key. But what I know is that the most important thing is to have an alignment of both. Oh, I have been beyond the town where nightshade black and mandrake grow, and I have heard and I have seen what righteous folk would fear to know. For I have heard at still midnight, upon the hilltop far forlorn, with a note that echoed through the dark, the winding of the heathen horn. And I have seen the fire aglow, and glinting from the magic sword, and with the inner eye beheld, the horned one, the Sabbat's lord, we drank the wine and broke the bread and ate it in the old one's name. We linked our hands to make the ring and laughed and leaped the Sabbat game. Oh, little do the townsfolk wreck when dull they lie within their bed. Beyond the streets, beneath the stars, a merry round the witches tread and round and round the circle spun until the gates swung wide ajar that bar the boundaries of the earth from fairy realms that shine afar. Oh, I have been and I have seen 
in magic worlds of otherwhere, for all this world may praise or blame, for ban or blessing, naught I care. For I have been beyond the town, where meadow sweet and roses grow, and there such music did I hear, as worldly righteous never know. She had told me that something that was quite impressive, that there was a man in my life, an older man, older to me, um, that was uh, trying to stop me from moving forward or achieving things. And she had told me that once this man would have been out of my life, things would then flow. In a way, I mean, it sounds quite spooky, but in a way it did manifest because um, after the hypnotherapy session, something bad happened to me. I've been victim of like a tort or you can call it an assault or uh, something bad that was from a man. Which, I mean, obviously if I wouldn't have the hypnotherapy session, you would say things happen. Sometimes people come in your life and they're meant to be in your life. main difference in, in practice now is the internet which means that people can find information very easily and can form communities of practice some of which will exist virtually and some of which allow people to come together in physical space much more readily than they could have done say 30 years ago when I was first becoming involved in, in Wicca. So I think that witchcraft in common with any aspect of human experience is subject to changes in, in, in fashion, uh, in media, uh, developments in technology and new ideas um, uh, that, that develop. So for example now there are quite large numbers of people who would identify themselves as witches who are solitary practitioners um, whereas or, uh, someone who identified themselves as a witch 30 years ago would typically have been a member of the Alexandrian or Gardnerian streams of witchcraft. So it's a, it's a proliferation partly based on the fact that all of these systems take uh, it as critical that humans should find their own spiritual way. 